You're listening to the Hayek Program podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. So, I mean, you guys don't talk about it in the in the book, but another connection could be the way the Ostrom's research program yeah. evolved. Yes. Uh, because Vincent, of course, was very influenced by Frank Knight as well. Um, yeah. On your last point, by the way, I think there's a, another issue which is important in your book, which is why Rawls and Buchanan are so connected. And then that right. means that you could actually have those discussions. But... You know, um, I think a great paper could be written similar in vain to what you're talking about, about these two positions of contrasting Lynn Ostrom's view of development economics with Esther Duflo's view of development economics and and developing those ideas, I think. Um, And but it's unclear to me that, you know, if, if we expect economics to do something for us in the public sector, then an economics which raises doubts about the economist's ability constitutionally, you know, not, not, in right. the, I mean, just by the nature of our discipline, mm-hmm. those are going to be hard sells because <laughs> we, exactly. we want, we want, we want, uh, we want to be able to fix things. And in order to fix things, we need to be able to at least appear to be like plumbers that put the pipes in the right place rather than, you know, leading to, you know, Hey, I don't know. You know so, um, yeah. And let alone Jim's, you know, kind of uh, notion of, of the economists are reduced to committing their hypotheses to the test of democratic decision making. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, that's the opposite of the way even people think about what he's talking about with regard to the balanced budget amendment. It's like as if he wants to, like, impose. But the whole point is it's a hypothesis to be tested. Right. right. Yeah. 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 David, do you have anything you want to? Oh, I was just I was just thinking as you're talking about that, that the um, um, Jim's um, line that we have a duty to be cheerful and that one of the things we discovered when we're doing some stuff on Smith is that Smith has got cheerfulness as an externality. It's a whopping externality. And and people are very careless that they confuse wealth with good cheer and in Smith and he doesn't. And so I think that um, uh, one of the the things we struggle with, you struggle with the two, lots of us struggle with is the difference between what Jim really said and what he's reported to have said. And this is so, so publishing documents in some sense is a revolutionary act. Yeah, Eldridge would like that. <laughs> so this is okay. Let's let's actually publish what he said, and then so we reduce the cost of getting things right. Now, does that mean we're going to get things right? No, of course it doesn't. But it does. It reduces the cost, and so okay, and that's and that can be a help, and that's yeah. one of the things we can do. One, one really difficult challenge these days, though, is intentions. So, yeah. so some will argue that it doesn't matter what the words are. What matters are the intentions. Of yeah. the speaker. And if the speaker's no longer around to defend himself, then it's, that's a really tough problem. Uh, I like to say, the, the, how do you react to this? I, I like to uh, say that the problem is, is a philosophical problem, is that too many modern intellectuals bought into the idea that we're supposed to engage in a hermeneutics of suspicion, as opposed to a hermeneutics of uh, criticism. So there's one thing to be critical of, of you know, uh, the documents and the times and things like that. But another one is to always hold them in suspicion that whatever's in front of you must not be really what's really there in front of you. Right. And I think that move is tied into the way yeah. various strands of postmodernism got absorbed into the intellectual culture. I don't 
Um, yeah. And so I think that's a real issue is, and you know, if you would have asked me 20 years ago what I thought about skepticism, I would have been, we're all for it. You know, the skeptical inquiry, you know, this is what we do as scientists, right? But now I think it's criticism is different from skepticism. And yeah. that there's a thin yeah. line between those and it's easy to confuse one with the other. And we've right. definitely right. moved into this other era. And I think David's point about publishing the words as a way to, um, you know, to, to counter that uh, suspicion. You know, yeah. uh, we can talk, we can speculate about intentions, but we know what the words are. If, yeah. if we know what well, the I, words are. I wanted to ask you this question because it's a broader question of a turn. So you guys have been superstars in the field of history of economic thought since you entered into the profession. All right. So um, and, uh, you know, young people have been looking at you guys as models. You, you know, the Summer Institute had this huge impact and generated, you know, someday someone should do a Summer Institute study the way you did on the Earhart Fellowship study yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of the various people who, when they were graduate students, went there and then wrote books and did all this stuff like that. Um, and so you've seen the beginning. So in the beginning, you know, the economics profession, the history of thought was a lot of these internalists. It was a history of economic thought, history of economic analysis. And then it became kind of fashionable to do this history of economics as science studies. And then from science studies, it became this broader thing. And so in an interesting way, you guys have been, for example, David's book on how the dismal science God's name is actually a very deep, like, social history, right? I mean, here's the revelation that, you know, the debate between markets and socialism wasn't the debate at the time that the name gets called. It was a different debate that was going on. So like folks in the 1950s, when you look back to that debate, it's not the same debate that you're looking at. And so he's putting ideas in context. So it's very much like Pocock or Skinner or whatever like that. But, you know, and that's, that's one of the stories, but that's different than doing the Morawski type science studies or even, you know, what Roy Weintraub pushed uh, or Margaret, you know, did with her stuff or whatever. And so there's this, bit, this battle for the soul of, of, you know, history of economic thought. And then you get to the more modern kids and, you know, that's a whole other ball game, you know, about what they're doing. So, and at the same time, we've had this ability to not, to actually have archives digital which means I could sit at my home and I could do archival research as opposed to having to get a research grant to have to fly here, fly there, get access to a library. So we've had this explosion and you guys are very clear in the beginning about discipline, like what you are going to discipline yourself to. You're going to chain yourselves to what you have actual evidence on and not try to connect dots when there's no evidence in some sense. Uh, and that's not quite right because, you know, you have, you, you have a broader theory to put things in fit them. So it's not, I'm not just saying it's just, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. But uh, can you talk about the, the pitfalls and the dangers of that can derail scholarship as well as promote scholarship when you're working with primary documents and archives as your tool, as opposed to data sets? So this is your data, and, and, and I know you've thought a lot about it, and I think it'd be really important for people to address that and understand that claim. Well, so I'll just say um, there are a lot of pitfalls. <laughs> um, uh, you, can, you can get mired in, in the data, you know, in the archives, um, and, and, um, but that's really good fun. So it's, it's okay. not, a, it's a possible pitfall, but... Uh, but something will emerge. So, you know, you, you need to um, approach it with the sort of optimistic viewpoint that that's, you, you know, something will emerge. When I've thought about, when I've thought about this, um, you know, it seems to me it's important to, to um, think about your preconceptions up front and, and, and make them known both to your, to the extent that it's possible. I mean, you know, Right. We all have lots of things we, we can't um, fully appreciate about ourselves, but, but you know, uh, um, think about them, commit to them, and, and um, as I say, make them known. So, you know, we would never, we, we when we're um, thinking about a book of, of the most recent sort, uh, you know, one of the first things we, we thought was important to do was 
you know, talk about in the preface, you know, what documents, uh, how do we figure out, how do we decide, uh, you know, what to publish, what not to publish. Um, and, and um, you know, so make those presuppositions visible so that other people can, can criticize us for them or not. Uh, and, and, um, uh, but are certainly aware of them. And then, and then, you know, as I, um, we had to select documents. I mean, there, there you know, are tons of documents we could have uh, could have included in this thing. And at one point, we thought about you know possibly having a web presence or or whatever. Right. But um, uh, you know, make make the the documents um, at least a, you know subject to whatever constraints you're working with. Um, yeah. You know. Uh, available so that again, you know, thinking about what we just spoke about intention versus words. So people can check the words. You're not quoting selectively um, uh, and, and uh, you're, you know, you're being honest um, in the sense that you're letting people read the full thing. If you've only, you know, selected a paragraph from it, you've got the rest of it there. Um, I, I, um, I love your description of how you know the history of economics has kind of emerged over time. When I first um, got into the history of economics, it was very narrow. It was talking about very broad problems, you know, but but using very narrow um, uh, evidence. So you know, and we kind of got wrapped up in this question of you know what it, what are gold wages in Ricardo. You know, right. and people would write books about whether those are fixed wages or variable, you know, and, and so on. And, and, you know, at subsistence or not, it's a, it's a deep problem, but we sort of left, lost track of, of what the problem was uh, and really just kind of got into this, um, these debates over uh, very short phrases. Um, and so, you know, what I, what I love about what's happened over, you know, in, over the 90s and the, the, in the 21st century is that contextualization that, you know, the return to bigger problems, you know, like thinking about, um, uh, you know, so, so what's it mean to argue that we've got a subsistence wage, you know, and, right. and is it the case that, you know, that um, uh, uh, people are people in Ricardo versus Adam Smith? Uh, and we had just moved so far away from that, that I think we kind of wrote ourselves into oblivion for, Right. for many. And, and now we've sort of, I think, pushed ourselves back into actually being important to economics. Um, yeah. So no, I, I'll, I your description is important. No, I mean, I think that's, that's uh, great. I think actually, so I, just to talk to you about one of the more controversial discussions in the book has to do with Buchanan and Nutter's piece on universal education. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, because that's been a subject to a lot of debate. I think one of the really interesting things about your chapter and dealing with that is admitting also the possibility yeah. that Jim and Warren were not att uh, attentive enough to some of the downside risks and that they evolved and that they changed. And I think that the power of that changing is all the more powerful given the context that it's a move from 1959 or whatever to yeah. 1964 when yeah. they change and they don't actually make a big deal out of it and they didn't really have to pay a cost if they would have not made the change in 1965, right? Yeah. They pay a cost in, in 2020 if they don't make that change, but they don't pay yeah. it. And so, but they're making the change in 1964 or five, four. And you can look back and you can see parts of the argument already in the earlier one, which gets missed by everyone, right? Because right. it's a, uh, it, uh, education is a great leveler. Education is to provide, is to be provided to everyone. It's a great leveler Absolutely. because you're supposed to overcome socioeconomic uh, discrepancies. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be a redistributive tax. Yeah. It's gonna be held to a uh, state educational board. I yeah. mean, so you read the original piece, it's far removed from you know, even E.G. West or Murray Rothbard's, let's get the state out of education. Yeah, 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 claim. Yeah. It's actually, you know, a very different thing, but they, they clarify their argument. And then, of course, Jim clarifies his argument further in those letters. Right. Again, in 1984, which he was taking, he, the risk in him taking that was him to alienate all of his 
you know, buddies because he wasn't joining on the voucher right. program the way they did it, which is different from looking at it from today mm-hmm. back. But nevertheless, I think the fact that you guys recognize and admit that th- that science is about learning. Yeah. <laughs> science isn't about fixed positions. This goes back to your earlier point. It's about adaptation and adjustment based on us learning new things and learning where holes in our own arguments lie. And then we do that. And, you know, you don't do that in a, like just a, like a hand waving way. It's like a serious way. Like Jim and Warren might've been blind to certain things they shouldn't have been blind to. Yeah. They then became not blind to them and then they adjusted and adapted yeah. and they yeah. made depends. So I think that's a very important idea about understanding anyone in context. Yeah. Like, you know, what was learned So do it the other side. What was learned between Rawls 1963 and Rawls 1971? Like what, you know, like the Rawls of 1963 is different from the Rawls of 1971. What happened in between that made him adjust and change his views? I think we should do that for people on all the sides, right? And you guys do that and you do it by going to the text, you know, I mean, the the documents and the exchange that they have. Yeah. And I think that that's a model for everyone to deal with, especially as we wrestle with our problematic past, which we must well, do. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So I'll just say that was hard to, it was hard uh, to get it right. Um, so, you know, you, you, these are people we admire. Uh, and so you, you feel like you want to defend them, but then, you know, you need to really think hard about what their positions are and, and uh, you know, Buchanan, was uh, a, a model of a scientist in the sense that he he did learn and uh, revise and uh, you know think through his arguments. Um, so he didn't you know just sort of adopt a position and then stay right there with it. Yeah, um, I so, think actually this is a characteristic of different scientists yeah. that they come to a position and then they hold it the rest of their life. Yeah. Or what happens is they're lifelong learners. Right. And since all of us had personal interactions with Buchanan, you know, one of the things when you would go and have those little coffee meetings, you know, that Joanne organized or Betty organized right. and talk to him. He, he was never talking about literature that was old. He was always talking about literature that was currently going on. And it ranged from things in the journals to the TLS to other things like that. And if you sit down with Vernon Smith, it's the same thing. Right. Right. And so it's not ever backward like you know you would have to be the person that asked him to talk about the past right right? I mean to get him to do that at least that's my my memories you know which of course also are biased at some level but I remember always being excited because he was telling me to read books that I didn't know about you know I'd sit down and they would always weird books like you know there was this this woman that wrote a whole book on surplus value you know and Jim thought like I should read this book you know or whatever and I'd be like why am I reading a book about surplus value you know, how you're like, okay, I'll go do that or whatever. But, um, you know, it's, it's just a, a, a kind of intriguing thing that he had his finger on stuff that was going on. He was always, always moving. And, and you know, I, I've told this story a ton of times. I don't know if David was in the room at the time. He might have been. But in one of Jim's last talks that he gave, it was for the Public Choice Outreach Seminar. And it was in, they did it in August that year. So it was August of 2012. Okay. He passed away in January of 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he gave a paper on the constitutionalization of money. And as he walked out of the room, I had a chance to just sit and talk to him for a second. And I said, you know, how are you doing? You know, like just normal chit chat. And you know, that wasn't, you know, he wasn't like a normal chit chat guy. And so he says, he goes, well, he goes, I'm not too happy with this paper. I got to go back home and do some revising. And, and that was fascinating to me because here he is, you know, in his nineties and what he's thinking about is revising his paper. And I remember when he left thinking like, that's like what we should all strive to be. We should bottle that up and, and, you know, make sure that everyone thinks like that. Because if you go through life thinking that, you know, I got to go do some revising or as he put it, all work is work in progress, you know, these kind of things those little quips that he had are all about lifelong learning. And I think your book communicates that idea that it's not just, it, there is a doggedness to Buchanan, but never dogmatic. Like he, he's going to push this exchange versus allocation paradigm and whatnot. 
<clears throat> um, but it's, it's always learning and adapting. Right. And One of the things that really came as a surprise was when we collated versions of the school choice thing we saw the, um, the, 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 the final version um, excluded segregated schools. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, and I went around, I don't know when I stopped doing this, but I went around muttering, why don't people who are professors of history collate text I learned how to collate text my first some, my first year at Berkeley as an undergraduate. And I mean, maybe it's because of the world we live in where it's really important to know the difference between the first edition of Moral Sentiments and the last, right. or the first edition of Ricardo and the third edition of Ricardo. I mean, this is just how we live, but so that people automatically don't collate text and you know so that and you know and because i mean i mean I, we have grumbles about mclean's but she deserves credit and i hope we were generous about this she deserved credit for making that the school choice thing so important right. and but, but that because it wasn't important until her book yeah. none of us could go over to his office and say, hey, Jim, why did this come in? Why did you add this? What, what, what happened here? What, when did this come from? Mm -hmm. And so that, so that, you know, that's something, if we had known it would have been a phone call or a walk across, across the parking lot to, yeah. to, to clear up. But, and so that, um, and, and there's no, there's, as far as we could see there, and maybe you've, you've studied this stuff real carefully too, but there's no correspondence that we know of that speaks to that revision. It just, um, yeah. and so it's just, a, why didn't, why wasn't this obvious? And the answer is people obviously don't collate text, or maybe that's just such a specialist thing these days. And that we don't do history of economics. We don't really work with text. We don't think about a, a text as something dynamic. Right. Yeah, I think, so two things I want to say in response to that. The first thing is about McLean. So if, if in my own review essay of her book, which I was sent early page proofs of her book by the publisher because I was supposed to write a, an essay in a, in a, uh, in a sort of high profile outlet, I ended up by writing it as a book and what I view it as is a great tragedy because a high modern liberal and a classical liberal don't get to engage in a conversation when what would be really cool is to debate in a conversation over the effectiveness of means and ends with regard to some of these tough issues having to do with race, gender, inequality, and you know these other issues rather than the idea of team choosing. You know, this side believes in injustice, this side believes in injustice or something. And so I think there's a real like miss, missed opportunity there. The second point that I wanted to make is, David, just to explain the, the uh, collation of text. Uh, I think that you're referring to the fact that your first assignment was to go and look at the Oxford English Dictionary, right? And the origins of, yeah. of words and the meaning yeah, yeah, right. of and Absolutely. by the way, just so that you know this, I, I was just asked to write a paper on capitalism, by the way, for, you know, some big thing. And the first thing I start with is the OECD. I'm like, I, I, the, the OED. I'm like, oh, my God, David Levy told me that when I was a graduate student, <laughs> that you should go and check this out and look at, you know, the history of these words and see how they evolve and what they mean. And I'm like, all right. You know, and I did it and it framed the whole paper. So thank you very much. I wrote that paper, but um, I think that's such an important notion of what you're talking about, how text evolve, how authors respond, how they're received and then how they absorb. And we have to admit that if what we're doing is a science rather than if what we're doing is a religion. 
<laughs> in some fundamental sense, right? So can you further elaborate this issue of the, the collating of text? Well, I'll just uh, jump in as David's mulling it over and say, uh, you know, economists in the past wrote, wrote uh, obviously, fewer articles and more books. So they'd right. write a book uh, and then, you know, some years would go by and new things would happen, thinking of your comment earlier about contextualization and so on. Um, so with Ricardo, um, uh, you know, some years go by and machinery, the introduction of machinery because seems to become a really important economic question. Uh, and he spends a lot of time wrestling with that. Uh, and adds his famous chapter to his principles uh, book right. on machinery, uh, and and you know that's the that's the chapter that a lot of people then focused on um, later on. So so you know as as uh, in the past, especially 19th century, I think you know, uh, but 18th century as well. I think the additions of the book over time. Um, express different ideas of the political economists as they learned uh, about uh, or came to rethink uh, their original positions. Um, maybe it's not quite as important in the 20th century, but you know we found an important example. Um, sure did. In, in, yeah, in the education piece. Um, so it it it's not like it's unimportant, uh, but if it's the case that fewer books are being written, um, you know, by economists in 2021, um, then, you know, it, it sort of makes sense of the David's point that we don't think about collated yeah. uh, editions so much anymore. Uh, I also think your discussion of Samuelson's edition and yeah, the Soviet growth thing is, the, yeah. is another version, but the opposite yeah. lesson. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and people oh. don't study textbooks very much. You know, I mean, it's it's yeah. not uh, so. That's that's one study that we've done, but it's not. It's not. I don't know of other ones of you know how textbooks have evolved over oh, time. Yeah. It's an interesting well, question. I mean, one of the things I don't know. If, I don't know if I send it to you, uh, but we did a we did a chapter in the humongous book on Stigler, and we focused a lot on Stigler as the profession's designated collated editions checker. Yeah. Oh, what a job that is. So he checked Ricard Serafra's Ricardo for the American. And remarkably enough, Serafra has this fascinating conjecture, the chapter Sandy's talking about, how the, how the printing history of the, the third edition which is the machinery question comes in. So Raffer has this really, you know, for careful study of the text and said, you know, this doesn't make sense unless there was some sort of printing inter eruption that the, the book was changed as it was being printed. And what George did was he found in Columbia a copy that matched Serafra's conjecture to the T. And then... He sent the book to Seraph, and there's some very funny correspondence. We didn't understand it, and just, um, just what the hell's going on? What's his insurance business? And <laughs> so I gave the pa I gave a paper for us at the a meeting in Chicago on Stigler, and Steve Stigler was in the audience, and he came up after and said, "David, what happened is." The Columbia Library would not send the book to Serafra. So George took it out and mailed it to him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we got permission from Serafra's estate to publish the letter from Serafra back. And the Serafra's heir wrote to us and said, oh, thanks for the, uh, yeah, of course you have permission. And thanks for this because it solves a problem. What the, what the hell happened? How did this how did this happen? But and he did this. He did this for everything. He did it for the, um, for the for the John Stuart Mill edition. He did it for the uh, <laughs> oh God help us the Marshall edition. Yeah. Oh, and so okay, so so you know okay, so this was. This was one of the things he did for the profession. So somebody needs to check the collations. Yeah. And um, Serafa passed, uh, John Robson passed, the, the, the clown it did, the marshal failed. 
<laughs> we pu we published a letter from Viner saying, "Oh, I'm glad I saw your review, so I don't have to I don't have to review it." <laughs> and if you think, yeah, so it was so, but so you know, it's just not me as a young student at Berkeley learning how to do this or something. It's no, no, it's it's George Stigler himself is checking the collations. <laughs> So I want to just add one, one thing to that story, uh, which goes back to your opening remarks, Pete, uh, about ideology and so on. So these are guys who are on the opposite side of the ideological spectrum, who are right. talking about um, uh, different editions and collating right. and so on. So, you know, you've got Strafa, production of, of commodities by means of commodities, yeah. you know, surplus theory. Uh, and then you got Stiegler and you got, you know, in the mix also Hayek, if you're talking about the, the Mill uh, Taylor Here letters, uh, you yeah. know, corresponding with Strafa across this enormous ideological divide. Um, but yeah. they're all interested in what these guys said uh, and, yeah. and uh, getting yeah. it right. And, and, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, they hold these very strong positions and think they're right about what they said, but, but they can talk to each other. Um, and, yeah. you know, to your, to your right. point about ideology, it doesn't separate them. It's not such a gulf that they, they can't, can't talk. talk across it. Yeah, so yeah. it's so, you know, in your book, you have, you know, I mean, in, in the history of Jim, you have the discussions with Rawls. Yeah. Uh, Rawls is, you know, at some level, Rawls of the Rawls that's engaged with Jim and Hayek is closer to them than he is to the Rawls later on in some yeah. sense. But, um, but the conversation with Warren Samuels isn't something like that. Uh, right. The conversations between Knight and Clarence Ayers aren't like that, but they they find this way to have this ability yeah. to have discussion yeah. and and yeah. and learning from one another. Yeah. Okay, I, I want to get to the last question. I've been mindful that I've I've really you know we've gone over time here, but um, I want to I'm going to pare this down rather than the question that I had in mind, which is simply that you know you guys throughout your work you discipline yourselves by the archives. Um, but you're talking about a, a long period of time, you know, so, you know, uh, you know, more than a decade at UVA, but then the ideas percolate for a much longer period of time, even after UVA. Um, and so we're, we're talking about basically, you know, Jim, a 50 year career of gyms or something like that. You know, these kind of conversations that are going on are more than 50 years. Um, and there's a lot of, dis, you know, entangled webs uh, during this period of time and tangled events and tangled intellectual movements. And, you know, and so you're going through this and you're also trying to disentangle. In fact, one of the core, you know, chapters at the end of the book is disentangling Jim from other people that were also maybe of the same or, or viewed loosely in the same camp as Jim and you're disentangling that. And so I guess I was wondering, you know, in assessing these kind of disentangling exercises in the more nuanced positions from the less nuanced positions, um, you know, even within the Virginia school itself, the difference between say, you know, a Tulloch blunt force instrument in like the new world of economics or like Jim, you know, uh, you know, I, I have a paper where it talks about uh, Dick McKenzie, you know, writing about the constitution as a self-seeking enterprise. And, you know, basically Jim writes to him and says, look, you know, you've, you bought Tullock's position too much, you know, like, you know, there's, there's something else that's there, or, or you can see in correspondence, Jim dissing himself from median voter hypothesis, kind of mm -hmm. views into public choice or whatever. And so he's trying to disentangle, but how do we judge intellectual movements as, as critics, we often think that the way we should judge a movement is by its best practitioners, not by its worst practitioners. So I don't take the worst, say, you know, old institutionalist or worst old uh, hi historicist and view them as the one that I want to be a foil against. I try to take the best practitioner. So that's easy enough to understand from an intellectual point of view. But what is the moral assessment of an intellectual movement in its connection to, let's say, its most morally questionable advocates? And how do we sort that out and how do we disentangle or how do we live with it? Uh, I guess is the question. It's a hard question. Um, and, you know, we've done, we, we've done this for the 19th century uh, more than for the 20th century, um, you know, thinking about um, some of my heroes, 
at one point, um, Carlisle mm -hmm. or um, Dickens. Uh, and, you know, someone once said to us uh, when we were giving uh, something a long time ago at a conference said, um, you know, well, everyone was a racist back then uh, in the 19th century. Um, and, you know, that's a way to sort of let people off the hook. I mean, that was the point. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I guess if it were true, then maybe it's a way to let someone off the hook. Um, uh, but, you know, if you look at the evidence of 19th century thought, um, it's not true. Uh, right. And so then you can, you know, point to um, uh, a Carlisle or, a, you know, a Dickens or, or um W.R. Gregg or, you know, whatever, uh, and whomever, and, and say, you know, these are both on a sort of absolute level, these are, these are awful positions, but also, you know, put them, putting them in context, they were arguing with people, um, and John Stuart Mill, for instance, uh, and so uh, you can't let them off the hook, uh, either contextually, uh, or, or absolutely. Um, and I mean, I think there is, you know, there, there are some statements um, say in Carlisle that you can just, you know, whatever the context, it wasn't okay to say those, uh, those right. things. Um, uh, when you get to, you know, there are some things that are easy, like slavery, um, that is easy to kind of evaluate when you get to um, 20th and 21st century uh, positions, sometimes it's less easy to, you know, to sort of figure out on an absolute level, um, you know, this is this was just not uh, a position um, to be taken. But I do think, uh, you know, sometimes intellectuals in a movement, in a faction or whatever, an intellectual movement, um, sometimes are too easy on their colleagues, uh, and that's damaging to them. Then uh, it opens them up to. Uh, substantial and justified criticism, um, right. and I think it's been true, um, as I say, in the in the twentieth and the twenty first century. Uh, and uh, whether you whether you look at an idea in context or, as I say, absolutely, um, uh, you know, uh, it's important to call out bad ideas, whether they're in your tribe or not. Equal equal opportunity. Criticism of bad ideas. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> David, do you have a do you have a, a follow up on that? Well, just following up on on, on one of Sandy's point is that since we were focusing on Carlisle Mill, we've actually now started one of the more more recent things we've done. We've done this a couple a couple projects is coming to grips with Harriet Martineau. And that, that she's important because she is as anti-racist as Mill. And she was always close to Carlisle. Mm. Um, well, he got a little bit less. I mean, he, as he, he got more and more obnoxious. They, they separate a little bit. But... Um, the one thing that she found sensible in Carlisle was his doctrine that we work for its own sake. And that's, of course, the difference with Mill. But so, but Mark, so Mark No found that resonated. Maybe we do work for its own sake. And it, and that, and so one of the, one of the things that, and this goes back to Sandy's point about the about this wonderful correspondence between Stegel and Rafa is when there's high dimensional research going on, people who disagree vigorously in one dimensional can be absolutely Amazing. close in another dimension. And you know her work on her work on um, the Hayek mill um, was, you know, that Hayek found the the letters from James Mill to Ricardo and 
And uh, so she probably heard the letter from Sir, from Sir Rafa to Keynes about Hayek discovering these things. And so one of the things, in addition to the Sir Rafa stuff, we even have more stuff in the sticker thing from Ronald Meek. <laughs> so, oh, <God. laughs> and so that so that when you stop, there's a a dimension of which we can agree. And if that dimension goes away, the distances get bigger because there's no, I mean, yeah, you know, Seraphra and Hayek are great textual scholars and Stigler's real good. And, and, and so that, um, you know, so when that goes out of the literature, then, then, then there's no intersection of, 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 you know, of, of preferences. So there's no, yeah, you get sort of bad views on this, that, or the other thing, but golly, he's a great scholar, right? Okay, so that, so that there's something, there's a, so getting rid of the history, when the history goes away, there's a, a research area of overlapping competence and interest that goes away, and I think that may not be so helpful. And it's just something that was sort of, str it really, it really, it, I mean, it, it came in that she was, do, you know, the, the, the Hayek Serafra commonality, they, neither one of them could be in the war effort because they were naturalized. Um, and so they did serious, their, their great history, of, their great history of ideas. And they cooperated, they, they cooperated. And so that, um, if you're not a historian of ideas or something, you're not going to see that cooperation. You're only going to you're going to focus on the things where there's conflict, and that's, I think, not helpful. Right. Yeah, I mean that's. I mean, I guess that's the the, the question is today is whether or not you know we have uh, enough areas of of yeah. commonality, enough commitments uh, to the values of the commonality that it doesn't matter about our ideological divides. Um, but we still find common ground. So mm -hmm. anyway, I want to thank uh, all of you. Sandy is a dean and I've eaten up her time on a Friday morning as a dean. And I know that she has uh, pressing issues, but hopefully it's been somewhat of an escape for you. It has uh, been. But uh, I cannot recommend uh, highly enough uh, towards an economics of natural equals uh, fresh from Cambridge University Press in 2020. And that means in COVID years, it's out just now. <laughs> so it's, a, it's fresh off the press. So uh, please go out and get it. It's a brilliant contribution. And the work that the two of you have been doing for decades has been fundamental to our science and to the field of uh, history of economic ideas in, in particular. So I want to thank you for uh, taking the time today and to thank you for writing this book and for all of your work. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.